Hello, welcome everybody to our Santa Compliance webinar. We are happy you're here. My name is Leah Kelly, and I'm here today with William Simmons and Chad Caldor of Littler Law Firm, along with Brian Riddle, who is our EVP at 10th Street. Uh, they will be leading the webinar, but I just wanted to first cover uh, a few housekeeping items here, just so you know, as usual. The webinar will be recorded, and that will be sent out to you in within a 24-hour period. So um, please know that if for any reason we lose connectivity, the webinar will be rescheduled, and you'll receive notifications so that you can re-register. Also, remember your phones are muted during the presentation, so if anybody comes into your office at any time, um, that won't disrupt the webinar. We'll just keep on going. And second, you can, or third, actually, you can submit your questions anytime throughout the presentation, and you can do so using the text box under the questions section in your webinar panel. This way, you, just, you don't forget to ask, and we can worry able to answer questions as we're on the topic they pertain to, and that will help other audience members as well. So we'll try to answer them as we see them, but if we don't get to them right away, we will definitely be able to get to those at the end of the webinar. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Bill, and we'll get started here. Thanks very much, Leah. Um, so we wanted to start with a uh, little bit of uh, food for thought here. I got it. Here we go. Let me pass this over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was having the. There you go. Okay. So there's our lovely faces. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining here today. We're happy to present for you. Uh, myself and Chad are uh, shareholders, lawyers at the law firm of Littler Mendelssohn. And we regularly help employers and consumer reporting agencies through issues rega regarding background checks, including defensive litigation as well as advice work. Um, we wanted to start with a little bit of food for thought here today. So this is a quote from Neil Armstrong. And what you see there on their screen is a, the essence of it is, look, if you get overconfident, that's when something snaps up and bites you. And I couldn't tell you an area that jumps out more for this quote than what we're going to talk about today with regard to background checks. It's an area where uh, most companies that we talk to think that they have it completely covered or they think that somebody else has got the area handled completely. You know, oh, well, I'm sure our background check company has this completely covered. Um, and they, there's a lot of misunderstanding about who's covering what. And as a result, companies get hit with class action, um, which can be very expensive. So we wanted to kind of go through an issue spotting presentation here today on some of those major issues and how to make sure that you're not being overconfident and something doesn't snap up and bite you. And um, Brian's going to talk a little bit on the next slide about uh, what the type of environment is that we're facing here. So Brian, I'll yeah, uh, thank you. Bill. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is Brian Riddle. I'm the EVP of Operations here at 10th Street, and I handle the product leadership for um, all things compliance with regard to our products. Um, so this what if screen is painting the picture of, you know, why should we pay attention to uh, compliance? And compliance in 10th Street terms can be ban the box, it can be pay equity, it can be making sure that your disclosures and authorizations, what we used to call releases, are in order, and it can also be pre-adverse and adverse action letters. Um, but when we talk about the, the size and relative scope of which ones of those are the most important, it's definitely the stuff that's on the FCRA side. So that's going to be your releases, your disclosures and authorizations, um, and your pre-adverse and adverse action letters. And the reason that we're saying that is because that's where um, I've seen, especially in the last few years, our clients have been sued quite a bit um, because by law firms that are being extremely aggressive with regard to sending test applicants to go uh, find law firm, uh, sorry, trucking companies to sue. Uh, last year, there was a single law firm working with a single client or of theirs, a single driver, who applied to over 80 of our clients um, and then ended up suing 16 of them. Um, and the idea is you might think in terms of, well, um, this really arcane, it only affected this one driver, but in every single one of those cases, 
and I see this because I see the subpoenas and I see the request to cover the records to make sure we don't remove them, um, they're trying to make it a class action. And so it's not just that one driver that who's, who's violated. The goal for that law firm in having that candidate apply to so many places and then turn around and make sure it was to see which ones of those were going to follow the FCRA and which ones were going to violate the FCRA. And in cases where they violated, uh, they're turning around and they're trying to make a class action lawsuit. So they're in discovery seeing whether or not it's a, a pattern at the firm or at the trucking company. And then if it is, it costs you for everybody that you've run a background screen on, whether or not they've been hired, uh, going back a couple of years ends up including in the class. And so it is a, or five years, it's not $1,000 for the driver, it's $1,000 for every driver. And I want to acknowledge ahead of time that, um, I mean, I think Bill and Chad love this, but it's not my favorite thing to talk about because it's arcane and it seems like it's just lots of details and it's lawyers that, you know, and, um, and those aren't those things that we like to talk about, but these are things that are, I see every day and really matter to our clients. And so if there's one thing you take away, it's that this stuff actually does matter and we have to pay attention to the details. 10 Street is here to help you. We can help you be compliant, but compliance is more than just the software and the language that you're using. It's also the program that you have behind the scenes that you're at your business. So the goal here is obviously we don't want uh, there to be class action lawsuits. We want there to be like individual, uh, if there's an issue, it might be a one Z or two Z so that they can't be turned into a class. So anyway, we'll talk more about that later. But the goal I wanted to make sure that you all knew from a scope perspective is that the legal environment is litigious as we've ever seen. And that's why we're talking about this today so that you know that this isn't just like a little thing. It's a really big deal on the FCRA stuff. Thanks, Brian. This is Chad Caldor from Littler Mendelssohn. Um, and I'm just going through the agenda really quickly. Uh, as Brian mentioned, you know, there are lots of other background check laws out there. We're, we're not covering those today. We're not going to talk about, you know, for example, state ban the box laws. We're not talking about you know, Title VII and how that comes into play with background checks. And, and we're not really talking about the state mini Fair Credit Reporting Act type of laws. What we want to really focus on today uh, for you is the the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, and, and for the reason Brian mentioned, that that's where the, there's really the, this teeth of a potential of up to $1,000 uh, per driver you've run a background check on in statutory damages. And just the way that that statute is set up, it really does create low-hanging fruit in some cases for these plaintiff's attorneys to try to come after you with these class action lawsuits that can be extremely costly. Um, so the agenda for today is going through just the basics and the background of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, such as when does it apply, um, you know, what triggers it, um, and we're going to talk to you about what we're seeing as, as the biggest class action uh, risks, which would be um, the consent form issues and then these process issues with sending pre-adverse notices and, and making sure you're following the correct processes on the back end when you may want to reject an applicant uh, based on their background check. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with just discussing some of the insurance issues that we, we see. And, you know, really that section is about, you know, this idea that a lot of people think they're, oh, well, I have insurance. I'm covered. No problem. Um, but these, these lawsuits are unique and they sometimes fall within exclusions to your insurance coverage. So we want to make sure you're asking the right questions of your insurance broker or, or insurance counsel. Um, so that's the agenda. <laughs> Jumping into the FCRA basics and background. Um, the, the name of this law is, is very deceiving, and I have clients all the time who, who are misunderstand just because they, they say, oh, yeah, I've heard of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Doesn't that just, just apply to credit reports? No, it, it doesn't. It, it's way broader than that. And it, it generally applies whenever you use a third party, you know, background check company, you know, the, the technical legal term is consumer reporting agency, but it's really anybody who's running background checks for you. Whenever you use them to assemble information, about an applicant or an employee, more than likely the, the FCRA is going to get triggered. Um, you know, it's not just criminal reports, it's not just credit reports. Um, if you're getting MBRs from a background check company, then this law is going to apply. If you're getting transportation employment histories from a background check company, it's going to apply. You know, verifications like social security numbers or CDL licensing verifications. If you're getting those from a background check company, then this is going to apply, and you need to make sure you're following the proper steps to avoid that class action liability that Brian mentioned. 
So Brian's going to talk a little bit more about the FCRA litigation environment um, and, and what we're seeing in this industry in particular. Yeah, so I kind of covered it a little bit. I might have gotten ahead of myself, but uh, essentially what I'm seeing is I get to see the subpoenas from the plaintiff's attorneys. Um, I get to see uh, the request for the maintenance of records so that uh, they can later be reviewed and submitted as evidence. Uh, where these plaintiff's attorneys are asserting that they're trying to make uh, willful violations, which we'll cover in a little bit, um, that would trigger class action lawsuits across multiple uh, multiple drivers. And it's 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 for big companies. Like if you look at the 16 of our clients um, that have been sued, of the 80 where the person applied, um, it's big it's big people that everybody in this room has heard of, and it's also small companies that um, are far more specialized. Um, you know, they they're casting a wide net uh, in terms of who they're who they're deciding to sue. So if you do happen to be a small person, you've got 100 trucks or 50 trucks. Uh, don't think that makes you immune. So thanks very uh, much, Brian. Um, and. I think another thing to just add to this is is the last bullet point, um, Brian, which you probably see as well, which is the attorneys actively searching for targets. So that it's not just that you did something that was uh, that screamed out as, wow, this is wrong, and the trucker is coming after you because you really harmed them. It's quite a lot of times the other way around, attorneys soliciting truckers to apply to a bunch of companies hoping to find violations. So it's far different than normal discrimination cases or other issues that you might get um, where, you know, you've affirmatively done something wrong and now the trucker's really angry. It could be they're coming to you actively searching for a potential violation to file one of these lawsuits. So we just wanted to um, go into the uh, kind of basics of the Fair Credit Reporting Act here um, so you understand the big framework and then we'll get into the details that a lot of companies miss and become costly in later slides. So starting at the basics, the first step of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is basically informed consent. It means that the person understands that they're going to be subject to a background check when they apply for employment with your company or when they apply as an independent owner operator with your company and that they've given authorization for that background check. That's a simple enough concept. However, there's language in the Fair Credit Reporting Act that says the general standard for getting that disclosure and authorization is that the disclosure is contained on a document that consists only of the disclosure. And that terminology is has what has caused so much confusion amongst the courts and so much liability for companies because what seems like on its face a pretty simple requirement, hey, we told them they would be subject to a background check and they agreed to it, becomes actually an exercise in wordsmithing forms and deciding whether each word and each phrase and each sentence really has to be in the disclosure document for the background check or not. And Bill, this is Brian. One thing that I'd like to just indicate really quick is that 10th Street, the way that this, you know, when it's a separate sheet of paper and everybody's filling out a paper-based application, it's more obvious. Uh, when it's online as part of the process, it's maybe a little less obvious. But in our world, that means have your uh, disclosure and authorization in a separate document and you can eat on, on a separate page as a standalone page so that the person's acknowledging that page and then we render it separately as well. And also, generally speaking, we recommend that the disclosure be separated from the authorization. We'll combine them into a single document on our side, so it's a single PDF, it's two pages long. But the important part of that is at least that it's a separate conspicuous document, not necessarily that the disclosure is separated from the authorization, although that's what we generally recommend. Right, great point, Brian. Um, yes, if you're using electronic environments, there's always those particular issues as well to keep in mind. Um, then the second step, generally speaking, of the Fair Credit Reporting Act involves notice to applicants or employees when they will be subject to an adverse action as a result of the background report. Um, it sometimes helps to understand what at least the purpose of that requirement is. The idea is that background check companies can be 
can work very hard and be very diligent to try to get you the most accurate information as possible. But understand that there is not really that one size fits all, 100% accurate criminal database like you see on TV shows um, about the law or CSI or you know the FBI where somebody just types in a few characters and boom, here it comes everybody's 100% accurate criminal history or um, background history and where they worked and where they lived. Um, it actually takes a lot of research through all of the various local, state, and federal courts to find information about people, um, let alone contacting previous employers for things like employment history or drug and alcohol history or accident history. And so the idea is that it's entirely possible that information on the report, though you know, diligently gathered, is not in fact accurate or does not in fact pertain to the person. So the idea is give a copy of the report to the person, let them review it, give them a chance to tell you, hey, before you take any action about this, that criminal conviction on there is not me, or that suspended license is not me, um, or that accident history doesn't pertain to me, I have a common name. So um, the idea is give them a copy of the report, a summary of the rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act so that they can take some sort of action in response um, including disputing the accuracy or completeness of the report so that you are acting on accurate information. Yeah, and Bill, just to chime in really quick, uh, we use the term adverse action because that's the term of art that's used in this space. And, and if somebody's brand new to this, they may not know that for purposes of hiring an individual, uh, adverse basically means that you're choosing not to hire them as a result. That's the adverse action of that part. Um, and pre-adverse action is referring to what steps you take before you actually do the, the, choose the selection not to, or the decision not to hire them. And the adverse part is what happens when you've made the final determination. And so we'll get into that here in a little bit. But it's all about whether you hire or don't hire the individual. That's the adverse part. Right. So the idea is if you got a report back and there was something concerning to you, you would give a copy of the report to the person, let them explain it if they have an explanation, let them tell you if it's inaccurate. And then once you have whatever information they provide or they haven't provided any further information, then you make the final decision not to hire them. And then you issue what we call, as Brian noted, is the term of art adverse action notice. It's essentially the letter that you send them saying, look, we are not going to hire you. And, and part of the reason is because of the information that was on your background report. And you see some in the bullet points here, some of the information that's required by statute. So it's specifically in the statute to be in that second letter notice that goes out to the applicant. So that's the uh, basics of uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, now we have uh, some issues with regard to, you know, the specific issues with regard to the forms. So, Brian, um, I know you have some thoughts about kind of the use of old forms and uh, people thinking they're okay, so I'll, I'll let you speak a bit as to this slide. Yeah, so broadly speaking, what I want to, there's a couple points I want to make. One of them is, is that uh, 10 Street is, uh, we're software that enables you to be compliant, that helps you in your compliance program, but just because you use 10 Street doesn't mean that um, you're automatically all set. Because if you give us the release language or the authorization language that you've been using for a long time, you know, we don't vet that. It's not like we run it past Bill and Chad every time to see whether or not it's legal. We just go ahead and implement it because it's been vetted by your legal team. Um, so it is possible to be using our software and to not be in compliance with the FCRA. And when we notice it, we'll say something, but, um, but we're, not, we're not reviewing those things. And especially... If you've been using, uh, if you haven't had your forms reviewed in the last couple of years, um, I wouldn't say that the ground has completely shifted, but plaintiff's attorneys are attacking very specific technical minutia of those uh, disclosures and authorizations. And so if, if you haven't had that process reviewed in the last couple of years uh, by a competent FCRA employment law attorney, uh, we very highly recommend that you uh, have them go through your language because there has been there have been 
several cases recently even that would affect that language, that things that were previously okay to say before are no longer okay, which we're gonna get into here in a little bit. But the greater point is, you, know, is you are responsible for your compliance. Um, there are, and, and we will implement the compliance program that you have, um, that you've specified. Yeah, and I can tell you the number of clients that um, we've come across where they tell us, um, well, look, I've been using this form for a long time, or, you know, look, I got this form a long time ago from my consumer reporting agency. I'm sure it's okay. They're the experts. They would have told me if something was updated um, in the process. And a lot of times that doesn't occur because it's not really their obligation to let you know. And other times you may just misunderstand the backstory of how that form came about. You know, you may have gotten a game of telephone where one person told another person told another person of how that form was developed. And it's actually not true. Somebody along the way had modified it in some way that now has become material. Understand that this law has been around for a very long time, since 1997, but that litigation about these forms only started in late 2013 for the most part. And the whole wave of litigation has really been 2014 or 15 through the present. So these are this is an old law, but new lawsuits. So things have definitely changed. So a form that you've had reviewed either five years ago could now have language that now has been the subject of lawsuits. Absolutely. And I want to provide a clarification too that I spend more time than I would have expected talking to my clients' uh, general counsels about these laws. Um, and while they are very good lawyers, uh, generally speaking, um, I spend a lot of time educating them on what the law says but mostly so that I can convince them to go talk to somebody like Bill and Chad um, about the details of it. Because um, I, 10th Street doesn't make legal recommendations like that, and the the lawyer is generally not. Um, it's you know there's so much to know about this. There's no way that a, a general counsel could possibly know. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that like I spend a lot of time educating them, um, and so it's really important to find somebody who really knows this type of law. And Brian, that's a great point to lead into this slide that we have here. And this will kind of demonstrate the point about what Brian's saying. If you look at these three forms that were all used by various company over, companies over the last couple of years, if this form just crossed your desk and all three of these forms just crossed their desk, at a high level, look at the number of paragraphs, look at the shape and size of them, um, the general information contained in them, you would think that, well, they all must come to the same conclusion about whether these forms are unlawful or not. Um, and if something, one of these came to you, you'd think this is, seems okay. It's something that is in its own document. It's not a million pages long. Um, it all purports to relate to a disclosure for a background check. I see signatures on there. Somebody signed. What the heck could possibly be the problem here? And what you see on the bottom here is that courts have disagreed about these forms that on their face, look roughly the same in terms of whether they're a violation or not and whether they're a potential willful violation, which under the Fair Credit Reporting Act results in the potential for millions of dollars of automatic statutory damages penalties. And the one in the middle is particularly interesting because um, the lower court, there's, you know, in our court system, there's lower courts and higher courts that are courts of appeals. And the first court that got a shot at looking at the middle form said, you know, I don't think it's entirely lawful, but it's not a willful violation. So there's no statutory damages. And of course, nobody was really harmed by signing this form. So there's no actual damages. So the case is basically over. Um, so, you know, you may have screwed up the content a little bit, but it's not a big deal. But then the court above that court got a hold of the case and said, well, you know what, actually, we think that this is a violation and that it is a willful violation on its face, and that does entitle uh, the plaintiff to statutory damages. So that's even judges disagreeing on these things, let alone just everyday people trying to run their companies or compliance departments trying to run a million areas of compliance trying to look at a form. So it really shows you how the courts are disagreeing and that you really need to know what to look for in these forms um, because it's not going to be clear on its face, oh, you know, red flag, this is such a bad form that I shouldn't be using it for most companies. Um, another issue that we see 
missed or, or something to pay attention to is that there's arguably special provisions for disclosure and authorization for trucking employers. And um, this has essentially two sides of a coin. The first is um, that the exception only applies if your truckers are applying online or by phone, not in person, and are subject to a background screen before you meet them in person. In that event, there's slightly lessened standards for the disclosure and authorization forms. But the problem is that if you have a mixed workforce, uh, it could apply to some but not all of your people. And you want a uniform process that nobody screws up. The other thing is it will be hard in court as a practical matter to prove up exactly what the trucker did in the application process. And therefore, you're spending a lot of time uh, trying to prove in court, time and money, because in court, time is money, uh, proving up that the uh, more robust disclosure provision did not apply to this trucker, because it's not so easy to just go into court and say, hey, well, wait a second, court, uh, this person applied online, so this doesn't apply to us. The court will say, okay, but that's evidence on your end, and you got to go through, you got to give the other side all the evidence, you got to go through some uh, questioning under oath, and then, you know, file a motion on that seven months from now. Um, so we generally recommend that if you can, you still follow the default disclosure and authorization provisions, which are the ones we've just talked about, that standalone document that's very skinny in nature um, with regard to the fact that somebody's going to be subject to a background check and they authorize it. And that if you have additional notices you need to give them about the screening process, that those are all contained on separate screens. The other yeah, and, side, and I, sorry, go ahead. Phil, I just want to point out really quick. So. Um, we don't really make recommendations at 10th Street with regard to law, but what we do say, I mean, if we, to the extent that we do make recommendations, it's to don't rely on the verbal. I've seen enough, just on my side, lawsuits come through where people are starting to look at notes to see what, what is it likely that the recruiter told the driver, um, and uh, whether the driver, you know, gave authorization and somebody made a note of it, and those are the things that are being relied on in court. And those, you don't want to rely on what a recruiter said, I mean, honestly, or, or that they remember to put a note in, um, especially when it's easy enough that you can essentially send them a link, they can sign their name, and then you have the disclosure and authorization right off their phone. You don't need to do the verbal anymore. It's, it's as much as you used to back before the advent of smartphones and things like that when that um, was really invented, that, dis that um, exclusion. Yeah, so that's a great point, Brian. I mean, your own records may not also, you know, you could spend the seven months going through the case and think the exception doesn't apply to you, but it turns out your records really don't support the fact that you did get disclosure and authorization from them even verbally anyway. So even if the exception applies, you still haven't complied with the law or you can't prove that you complied with the law. The other flip side of the trucking provisions under the Fair Credit Reporting Act is there's at least one what I would call bad decision, but it's still out there and therefore presents risk to companies, that even though there's these lessened provisions for trucking employers, uh, which were enacted to try to protect trucking employers, not make it harder on them, that if the exception applies, you have to provide additional bullet points to the trucker, um, which you know we have and we can provide to you but the essence is giving them the company name that's screening them, um, letting them know that company is not going to make a decision adverse against them, uh, and some other pieces of information that aren't all that onerous, but you got to put it on a different screen now because you don't want to clutter up the disclosure, and you got to make sure that additional information is provided to them because somebody might say that you are obligated to provide that additional information. So as you can tell in this disclosure environment, there's this push and pull hey, give these people all this extra information, but do it the right way because if you screw it up and there's too much on any one particular page, we're going to see you and say there was too much clutter on that page. Um, and that's the dilemma that companies are dealing with and um, why you really need to go through the forms and the forms process with a fine tooth comb to make sure you're complying with both those aspects. I've provided enough information, but I haven't provided too much information. I've done it in the right format. and. Like Brian said at the beginning of this presentation, we know when we're saying this, how silly it sounds. And we know that the thought in your mind is, well, come on, somebody files a lawsuit about this, clearly the judge is gonna kick them right out the door of the courthouse and say, 
no way am I entertaining this kind of silliness in my court. I have more important things to do. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. Judges are um, surprisingly welcoming to these sorts of lawsuits in court and uh, far more so than you'd ever expect. So they're used to a whole bunch of technical violation lawsuits on a whole bunch of different laws, um, many of which don't apply to you. And so these things do not shock them the way they potentially shock you. Hey, and Bill, one thing I wanted to point out, you know, a person asked a question about employees versus owner operators or contractor drivers uh, in our industry. And for purposes of the FCRA, they are treated the same. Um, there have been some cases that, or there have been some clarifications that, Bill, you could get into. But needless to say, when, when we use the term um, uh, employee, it's, it applies to your owner operators and contractors as well. Yeah, and again, that's another area where that's what we advise for risk mitigation management because it's just not, it's definitely not clear that you would get out of one of these cases because somebody's an independent contractor. And so for a checklist here, for each section, we're going to try to give you a checklist of basically homework, something you can go back to your office today and look at um, so that we're not just, you know, doing this presentation to try to scare you. We want you to be able to start the fix. Um, back where you are if there's something that needs to be fixed. So the first thing you can take a look at when you go back and look at your forms is, do you have a sentence like the first bullet point in your form? If you have a sentence like the first bullet point in your form, you definitely need to get it checked and you, you should remove that sentence from your form at a bare minimum. And also having that sentence in your form suggests that there may be other issues in your forms. And I say that because Recall back that case I was telling you about with that middle disclosure form where the higher level court said, no, actually the form's a willful violation of the law and as a matter of law automatically subjects the company to statutory damages. Well, that form had one of these releases of liability and that's the thing that this co that court said was definitely a violation of the law. So you, if you have a form like this, you want to get that removed um, as soon as possible. You also want to take a, length, a look at the length of each page of documents that you have with respect to the disclosure. If it's really long, chances are there's stuff in there that a court could say should not be in the disclosure form. Um, look at where your state law notices are. Are they on their own page, separate, or are they together with the rest of your standard disclosure? In other words, do you have a page, but it's pretty jammed with type, and some of that jammed with type stuff is oh, and if you're in this state, you have this filing right. And if you have this, if you're in this state, this particular law applies. That's something else that courts have been pointed to by plaintiff's lawyers on these lawsuits. Look at your type size and the pagination. So again, if you've got a really jammed form and it's little type, chances are there's stuff in that form that people could challenge as to whether it really needs to be in the form or not, and therefore a potential violation of the law. Look at your pagination, and this is something that does catch companies by surprise. You've got different pages of information um, on disclosure. So you say, okay, look, I separated it out. My first page is, you know, one paragraph long. Perfect. But if, the, if you have, you know, a 10-page document and it's all paginated together, uh, lawyers we've seen argue say, no, but those aren't separate pages. They're paginated all, I'm not sorry, they're not separate documents. They're all paginated together. And so a 10 page document is a single document. You've combined it all together. Again, I know silly stuff, but it's some stuff that you can also control. So if you see something where it's paginated all together, it's in your power to be able to remove that pagination and make it so each page is paginated um, with its own separate page number to make abundantly clear that each page is its own document. Um, 1681 within, information. And I just want to point out really quick instead of 10th Street, so we rendered each release, each authorization as a separate document. And then you've seen the Intel app where it's all squished together as well. So we render it as for convenience in one thing, but it is definitely rendered as a separate document. Yep. And then 1681 information is the information that I was just talking about with regard to truckers, so a special notice of uh, information that could arguably apply to people who are regulated under the DOT. And then independent contractor language, you know, if you do, if you are a company that does use independent owner operators and you do want to try to at least preserve an argument that these provisions don't apply to you, 
Um, so, for instance, you have your forms and somebody has some crazy cockamamie theory about why they're invalid and you want to be able to say, yeah, but you know what? At the end of the day, we weren't required to do this with regard to the independent contractors anyway. Well, it's important in those forms that you use for owner operators that you refer to them as independent contractor owner operators. So that it's very clear that they're not your employees and that you understand they're not your employees. Because if you have them sign a form saying, you know, for employment purposes, we were going to obtain your background check. And then you later want to argue, well, this wasn't really for employment purposes. It was for an independent owner operator. You can see how a court might look at skew at that and say, really, your own form says something else. So right. and these are clear, all things that you can go back and check. Yeah. And, and to be clear, we have uh, customers who hire own or who are contract with only owner operators. Um, and we have some that do employers. And it is common to have a single disclosure and authorization that can refer to both of those. Um, but you do want to make sure that um, that what is stated in that disclosure and authorization um, is correct in terms of what you're actually doing as far as employment or contracted or both. Yep, and now we'll turn it over to Chad. All right, so costly background check process issues. So. Um, this is really getting into the, the, the second stage or, you know, we, we talked about this in stages earlier where the first stage is getting that disclosure and authorization that allows you to get the background check report. Um, this section really focuses on, okay, now I have the background check report. What steps do I have to take if I want to take action based on that report? And there was a question that came in that says, if you turn down an applicant based on information they provided on the application without running any reports, um, what kind of liability is there? Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, there is no liability in that situation. If, if you're not running a report on someone, then the Fair Credit Reporting Act wouldn't apply um, based on something that they say in their application. Now, if um, you know, there may be, if it's a criminal um, question that they're responding to, there may be some state laws that apply and there may be some other laws that apply, but, but you know, focusing today on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, if you're not running reports, you wouldn't have any liability under that statute. So, just to recap what Bill mentioned earlier is that the FCRA requires that whenever you take, you may take an adverse action um, against an applicant or employee based in whole or in part on a background check, you got to provide them with a copy of the background report and a summary of rights under the FCRA. And, and as Brian mentioned, the adverse action, it, in this space, you know, it's really broadly interpreted, but most commonly what you're going to see is it means if you deny somebody employment, like an applicant, or you rescind their employment offer, you fire somebody um, because of, of something that's in their background check. And so, you know, one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, what, what does this apply to? When, when do I have to, to um, send this pre-adverse notice? And, you know, some of the, the, the Examples are, you know, okay, you have an employment history report that comes from a background check company, and it, it, you know, based on that employment history report, I might not want to hire this person. Then, yeah, you'd have to initiate that pre-adverse process. Um, if you, same thing with MBR, accident history, criminal records, anything that you're getting from those background check companies, if they may make you not want to hire somebody or um, rescind an offer or or fire them, then you would have to send out that pre-adverse notice that Bill mentioned, a copy of the report and a copy of the summary of rights. The, the one that we get a lot is a falsification issue. And so, you know, the typical scenario is that, you know, you got a guy who says in his application um, one thing and, 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 you know, for example, he could say in his application or during an interview, he's driven for 15 years and he's had no accidents ever. Um, you run a background check on the guy and it comes back showing he has three accidents in the past two years. Now, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's right on my application that any false information is grounds not to hire this guy. You know, I, he lied. I can just reject him outright. I don't have to follow this pre-adverse process. No, that, that's not quite true. You know, the, the, the trigger for the pre-adverse process is if it's based even in part on the background check. And the argument goes that you wouldn't have known about him being false or lying if you hadn't gotten that background check report. So, you know, the plaintiff's counsel would, there, there would argue the decision is based at least in part on the background check, meaning that you need to send that pre-adverse notice and you need to send those enclosures that we discussed, the background check report itself and the summary of rights. 
Um, the, the, the applicable exception there is, is what Bill was talking about a little bit earlier when you have remote applicant drivers who aren't coming in in person. Um, you know, we, we, if you have those, if you fall within that very narrow exception, there's a potential exception that applies here. But you know, we always advise people, we, we don't recommend relying on that exception unless you vetted it thoroughly and you're sure that it would apply because, you know, if you're, if you're doing it incorrectly, then you're subjecting yourself potentially to the liability we talked about before with you know, $1,000 for everybody you reject if it's uh, an exception that doesn't apply. And, and the safer way to go and the more conservative approach is to go ahead and follow that pre-adverse process every time, even with remote applicants. So the other big issue that comes up within this pre-adverse process space is, you know, as Bill mentioned before, the, the really the intent of this is that you're supposed to give the person a reasonable opportunity to review and dispute the information um, before you take a final adverse action against them. And so one of the things you need to think about is how much time will the, the trucker actually have to review and contact you after they get their pre-adverse notice? Now, the federal law, the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, doesn't actually specify a time period. And the courts have said that five business days from, from when the, the person receives the, the pre-adverse notice is a reasonable time period. So you gotta wait five business days from when they, at least five business days from when they get it to take the action, according to the courts. The, the problem with that sometimes is, you know, how do you know when they've actually received it? Um, you know, you can use trackers in some, in some ways, you know, with email or, um, certain overnight uh, couriers, but if you're sending it via regular mail, you, you really got to build in a few days for receipt. So we always tell people the best practice is at least eight business days if you're sending it by regular mail between the time that you send the pre-adverse and the time that you take that final adverse action um, and send the adverse action notice. Um, there are some local laws that may be longer. Philadelphia, for example, has uh, a requirement that you wait 10 business days between sending the pre-adverse notice and, and, and taking the final adverse action. But, you know, one of the bigger points is whatever waiting period applies, you cannot take any adverse action against the person during that waiting period. And so you can't rescind the offer during that period. You shouldn't fill the position during that period. And you can't otherwise indicate that a final decision has been made during that period or a plaintiff's counsel is going to look at that and say adverse action was taken um, before they had the reasonable opportunity to review their report um, and you violated the act. And that really leads into, you know, in, in, in general, longer is better if you can wait. And I know a lot of this depends on your business practices. Um, you know, there's a threshold there that you need to consider of, you know, what's best for business versus complying with the law. And, and there is some gray area middle ground there. But if you can wait longer, the more likely you're going to be in compliance. Um, so, Chad, this is Brian. One thing that I would add on that is um, in the trucking space, there's rarely a time when you fill a position and there's a driver that comes along that you would otherwise hire that um, you're not willing to hire as well. Like you just want as many drivers as you can get. So we, in other industries, you can imagine that you would have to hold a position open and in order until past the the pre-adverse action, the adverse action period before you could uh, fill that position. Um, in the trucking space, it's less of a problem because you've probably got 40 trucks on the, you know, in your parking lot that you're ready to get out. And so you, you can, there's less of a downside to waiting is my point. And so, um, you know, there are laws out there such as in, I believe it's Philadelphia that say that you should wait 10 business days. Um, since there's not necessarily a downside for waiting, it's our general recommendation that you should wait at least that as well. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and and on the idea of holding it, holding a position open, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, if there's another exact same position that you can fill, another driver position that you can fill, you don't have to hold one particular um, position open for the person who you may reject based on their background report. Um, and, and absolutely, the, the longer you can wait, um, it's a better and and in, and in some cases as Brian mentioned um, and under local law you do have to wait at least 10 business days in um, in Philadelphia for example so you know it sounds again like a, a pretty simple process I send this pre-adverse notice out um, I wait uh, for you know 10 business days five five ten business days um, and then I send out the adverse action notice and I make a final decision 
Well, you know, here are the, the verbal or system errors that we see all the time in this space. And this is where, you know, you could get um, a lawsuit if there's some systematic error, uh, including a, a, um, a class action like we mentioned before. So the first bullet point there um, is, you know, this is straight out of one of the first cases ever handled in this area where we had a manager who, you know, we, we had a company where they had the right process in place. They had a pre-adverse notice ready to go out the manager sort of jumps the gun and says hey you know we've, we've got your background check report back um and something's come up on it you know we have to this is a current employee we got to send you home for the day um you'll be getting some letters in the mail um you know we'll be in touch but you know don't come back in uh basically and you know that is a problem right you know so you've got recruiters or hiring managers or your your uh, managers of current employees who are, if they're not trained, they could be jumping the gun on these requirements and communicating the adverse action before the pre-adverse notice goes out and before the waiting period expires. Um, you know, so that's that's a crucial error that you need to clean up, and, and typically it can be cleaned up through training, um, or it can be cleaned up by limiting, you know, filtering communications through certain people who do know what they can and can't say. Um, the other one we've seen is automatic recruiting emails, and, and I've had clients who don't even know these are going out. So they've got these applicant tracking systems or they've got other systems that are set up so that once you flag a person um, under the, the system, you know, whatever flag you're using to send the pre-adverse notice out, the system was also sending out these automatic recruiting emails that said that they were rejected. So same problem as before, the applicant's getting this email saying a final decision has been made um, before they get the pre-adverse notice saying no final decision has been made, here's your background check. Um, you know, there's the same issue, very similar issue with how you're designating people um, within your systems. So if you've got a system where you, you mark the trucker as ineligible based on uh, the background check coming back, you know, plaintiff's attorneys are going to find that and they're going to say, oh, you mark them as ineligible automatically when a bad background check comes back. That's evidence that you had a final decision, um, even though you didn't follow the pre-adverse process. And so um you know think about the designations in your system whether they need to be changed and, and you know the other thing to do there is think about whether you could define those terms that you're using somewhere else like in a policy or a definition sheet or a email to recruiters whatever to be clear that these are really preliminary designations and we're not making final decisions on the applicant until that that pre-adverse process runs its course um, and then the final one is, you know, we, we call them adjudication matrices. Some of you may have them. It's the boxes that say, you know, if this person has this type of a conviction, then, um, you know, this might be a red flag or, you know, if they have these convictions, then they're green to hire, um, you know, individualized assessment policies and other policies. You want to make sure, again, to review those and make sure none of those are saying people are automatically disqualified. Um, based on you know receipt of a background check showing certain things because again that can be evidence for a plaintiff's attorney that there is really no true pre-adverse process in place it's just automatic disqualification so this is brian i want to provide some color on that as, as it relates to 10th street so many of you have a status of not qualified and you will start the pre-adverse action process and then you'll set the status to not qualified at the same time um, and really what not qualified means in the real world is uh, I'm setting him to not qualified, um, but if he comes back and he tells us that, hey, I object to something on my, my consumer report, my criminal record check maybe, and, and I'm right, you know, we'll absolutely hire you because we want you as a driver. It's not, we're not making that preliminary check uh, or preliminary decision. And so to Chad's point, like there have been a couple lawsuits even in the last year about this. Um, and... Uh, and I think in both cases, the defendant prevailed, but after having months of hearings and, and court cases. or uh, And so our what we would say is make sure, I mean, if you simply send an email to everybody, it says, remember, not qualified prior to actually sending the adverse action is, you know, it's not a final, de final designator. Even if you just have that in your hip pocket as an email that you send and that you train on as part of bringing on new recruiters, that's a really important thing to have that you can take and present to a particularly aggressive plaintiff's attorney um, that would short circuit the process or certainly help. Um, and so that's what Chad was talking about. 
And the second thing is many, many of you use third-party recruiters. Um, and so we've seen situations where a third-party recruiter refers a driver, the background screen is run by the company, and then it comes out and they decide not to engage with that driver, either for owner-operator or for uh, employment. Um, they send a pre-adverse action letter and then they notify the third third-party recruiter who wanted to know, you know, so what happened to this guy? And the answer is, well, we're probably not going to hire him because of the background screen. And then the third-party recruiter tells the driver, yeah, they're not hiring you because of the background screen. That is the exact wrong messaging that you want to send because the message needs to come from the pre-adverse letter that says, we will take this action in 10 days if this doesn't, if uh, it comes to pass. Not the, they're not going to hire you because. Um, and so you, from a messaging standpoint, it seems really subtle. And I'm sure most of you right now are throwing your hands up of, well, this is really crap and this affects my business process. I can't believe this is what this is. I know. I'm sorry. It is what it is, though. Um, and so I just want to put that out there as well for a third party recruiters that we need to be very careful when we're working with them about the messaging to people who end up uh, getting pre adverse and adverse action letters. Thanks, Brian. So, so the the checklist for this this particular section or the takeaways slash homework, um, you know, one thing we suggest to clients is to say, look, go and audit your process. Find a person, find a driver who was disqualified because of a background check, and then go through that file and figure out did we actually follow the process like we were supposed to? Um, you know, did we send a pre adverse notice? Was there any communication to this person that there, there was a final decision before they had that reasonable period of time to consider their report? Um, did we send both notices out? Um, you know, look at the process, how it's actually working right now, and figure out, you know, am I in compliance or, or do, do I need to shore up some compliance here? The other piece of it I mentioned earlier is training, you, you know, letting it, recruiters know, including third party recruiters, hiring managers, um, make sure they're aware that what they can say co can cost you money and that th this can create liability. Um, you know, let them know that they're not to say anything has been final until that pre adverse notice has run its course and they've got notification that the, the adverse action is, is finalized and going to be taken. Um, look at the content of your pre adverse and adverse notices. Uh, figure out when they're delivered, uh, under what circumstances are, are we triggering them. Make sure that, for example, falsification is one of the triggers for that if we're learning of the falsification through the background report. Um, and understand how they're delivered. So that way you can um, understand when to start counting. Um, uh, the, the counting issue I mentioned before, if they're delivered by mail, you want to add a few days. Um, if they're delivered by email or, or overnight, then you know, maybe you, you have a better gauge of when they're actually being received, but it's, it's important to understand how they're being delivered. So we're going to wrap up with insurance issues, and, you know, this is just more, more food for thought on understanding that, you know, it goes back to the original quote that, that Bill talked about, overconfidence, and that's when something bites you. If you think that, oh, I've got insurance, I'm covered, this is, this is fine, it's not a big deal, um, not so fast. You, the, you, know, you might have employment, employment practices, liability insurance, or EPLI. You may have a general policy um, that, that's in effect, but there are exclusions that could come in because these are really unique cases. And as we've talked about all along, Usually what plaintiff's counsel are looking for here are statutory damages because that makes it more likely that they can proceed in a, as a, with a class claim. And to get those statutory damages, they have to allege willful violations. And you see often exclusions in insurance policies that, that take away or, or do not provide coverage for willful or intentional violations of statutes. And so you may think you're covered, but when you really get into the, the nuts and bolts and the minutia of the, the insurance agreement um, or the insurance policy, you may realize, well, may, wait a minute, maybe I'm not covered. And so, you know, that's a, that's a really important point and it goes back again to, um, you know, although you may think you're good here, you may, you may actually not be. Um, the other potential exclusion is, is choice of counsel. You know, some of these insurance policies will limit your ability to choose counsel and I think Brian was going to speak briefly on that. Yeah, I am. And I know that, um, for most of the people who are on this on this call, you're not necessarily the person who is reaching out uh, concerning getting the EPL insurance, um, and also you're 
you're also ne not necessarily the person that is, you know, reaching up and picking up the phone to call the lawyer. Um, but the thing that I want to make really abundantly clear, and I get, I have no incentive to say that except for to take care of my customers, is you really need to get a qualified FCRA um, attorney to review your process. And again, whereas 10th Street, it can be part of that process, using us is insufficient and it's just us. It also is processes such as how you notify drivers, the language that you use when you're talking with drivers, um, and then also that your disclosures and authorizations and that your um, adverse action letters have all been reviewed by qualified counsel who are following you know, the two decisions that were decided in November of 2016, that they know all those details. Um, and that's, by the way, where uh, you know, Chad and Bill come in is that they are knowledgeable. They are, are following all of these decisions and they, they know all that is happening. Um, and so uh, make it's not just your lawyer. Work with your lawyer, your general counsel or your external counsel to find the lawyer who knows um, about it because you really need to find someone who, who knows this stuff and lives and breathes it. So wrapping up the insurance section, and then we can we can look at the questions that we may have missed along the way. Um, really, the biggest takeaway with, of, of this, if you have an insurance policy, or, or even if you don't have one, you, you know, talk to your uh, broker or experienced insurance counsel to understand what that policy says, or or what you need to have in a policy to cover these things, and, and ask the question: Will I be covered for an FCRA class action, or do, is there some modification that we need to make to the policy? Um, and then just quickly, the last point there. Um, some of you may have arbitration agreements, and a lot of times what you see is companies will have those with employees, um, but it's not a bad idea to have arbitration agreements with unsuccessful applicants as part of the application process. That's another way to uh, mitigate the risk of a class action or lessen the risk of a class action because um, you can have certain language in those arbitration agreements that makes it more difficult for the, the applicants to proceed in a class setting. Uh, so something else to think about as a, as a final takeaway. And then I think there are um, some questions that we may not have answered so far. So we can look at those. So I've been monitoring some of the uh, questions and, you know, a major question that wraps it all up is somebody asked about, well, wait, so if I run a criminal background check and we're going to use that information to make a hiring decision on a driver, are you saying that you have to send the person a copy of that information um, and wait and see if they dispute it? That's exactly what we're saying, and we know that a lot of trucking companies previously have not been doing that. And again, there are very narrow exclusions in the law, but the lawsuits that we're seeing are very much challenging whether those exclusions really apply and whether they're properly applied. And that's why we're recommending this approach um, now, which may be different um, from what you've been doing before. Um, and we have noted the exclusions, but the reason we haven't really covered them um, is that a lot of times we think it's a much better practice to have a uniform policy across the, com the company. And since those exclusions will only apply in narrow situations where a trucker has re applied remotely, um, it's a pre-screening process, not a current employee, and they haven't met you at all before conducting the screening, then it's a, it, in the employees that we deal with, that only winds up in companies encompassing some portion of all their applicants and you don't want to have a lot of different processes out there let alone the issues that Brian mentioned about being able to document that you still actually gave a verbal disclosure and obtained verbal authorization from the truck driver or um, had let them know about the decision in advance for the pre-adverse action process um, even if you didn't send them the report right away. So in other words, the exceptions are there. It's great to have it from a defense perspective. Like if we're defending you in a lawsuit, saying that your process was broken in some fashion to be able to have an additional argument for an exception, but it's not something you want to hang your hat on entirely. And the reason is that would then create a single question of law. Are you right or not that the exception applies? And if you're wrong, you're then facing immediate liability on that for $100 to $1,000 a person that you screened or that you rejected as a result of background check versus that being just one layer of a multifaceted defense to try to get you out of a case. And so a lot of companies, when faced with that massive potential liability, decide, well, there's no way I'm going to test with one judge, who knows what judge it will be, whether I was completely right on that exception applying or not, so we're going to settle. And that's when you get settlements that are 
in the uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars because the company is too scared to chance at everything on a huge liability award on whether they were right about the exception. Another question that we've gotten is, um, how do you find information about the local regulation? As you can see, we used up an hour on this presentation just on the federal law. Um, we give presentations all the time. You can reach out to Chad or I on local information. We have it at the ready. We have surveys available for you um, if you're interested. But one thing to keep in mind, and this is another reason to follow this process regardless, is that a lot of those local regulations do not explicitly contain exceptions for DOT regulated employers. So it's important to just have this approach universally. Um, I think we want to end on time. We will try to look at the questions and uh, respond separately if we can, but hopefully we've answered most of your questions and given you some good information uh, today that you didn't know when you uh, got into the presentation, or you did know it and you're doing everything right, and you can walk away with a nice rest of the day knowing that you're doing things well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and reply to a couple of these questions that we've gotten. Um, just really fast, with regard to MVR monitoring, if you have an active driver who is monitored via MVRs and that is considered a consumer report when it comes back through, if you make an adverse decision to terminate that driver, you owe him a pre-adverse action letter. Um, let's see. And I think that's the that was the only one that I wanted to touch on. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, our emails are below, and feel free to reach out. We would certainly uh, uh, be up for talking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.